Um, thank you all for being here tonight and um, for braving the cold April weather. Um, I think we're in the part of Ohio spring that's called false winter or false spring. I don't know what it is now, but, but yeah, it's just, yeah, thank you for being here. Um, let me just open us in prayer tonight. Um, dear Heavenly Father, God, I just thank you for the chance to get together. I thank you so much for the commitment these ladies have made to the study and to knowing you better, God. And I just pray that um, the Holy Spirit would work to reveal you to us because that is the only way that we can know anything about you, God, um, is through the Holy Spirit. Uh, we just ask that you would please use my words to bless these women, God, and just, um, yeah, eliminate me up here. And yeah, just please bless this time, Lord. Amen. So I really want to congratulate you guys for making it this far because I feel like after last week, I think that was probably the most difficult week to grasp. There were a lot of big weighty concepts last week. This week will also have some pretty deep theological concepts, but, um, but yeah, I think uh, I just really want to thank you guys and thank you for your commitment and, um, for really, um, really working to grasp these difficult concepts because I, I think these are a lot of things that we don't always think about. And I think that's a good thing that we are diving into these really, um, really deep theological ideas. Um, because you know, these lessons don't always have a lot of to do's at the end. And that's kind of what makes a lot of Christian books popular is they're kind of packaged into these neat and tidy how to they're, they're always, you know, Bible supported solutions to life's woes and, you know, the complexities of life, but they leave you with a lot of, you know, clear cut instruction of how to change and how to, how to be better at things. But, um, you know, really these lessons have prompted us to think deeply about our God and his character. Um, and in my preparation for um, these past weeks, I have kept, kept coming across the same idea. And it's this, that what a Christian thinks about her God is the most, most, most important thing about her. Um, because what we are doing here is not just an intellectual exercise. Um, we are doing something amazing. And I want to read to you this quote by Tozer because, you know, the, uh, yeah, in all the different books that I'm reading, there's just this emphasis on... On, on what we are doing here, guys, um, and how important it is. And Tozer says this, um, thank God there are some things that the intellect can know about God. And even though we can't know except by the Holy Spirit about God, yet the mind is never better employed than when it is seeking to know this great God Almighty. And if even the imperfect knowledge that you and I can have of our Father, which art in heaven, raises us to such rapture and satisfied so deeply the roots of our being, then what must it be in that day when we look on his face? What will it be in the day when we no longer depend on our minds, but when with pioneer eyes of our soul, we look without mediation upon the face of God himself? Wonderful. Um, so yeah, what we are doing is um, with the faculties that we have here, we are becoming more acquainted with God. And that is such an important thing. And last week we established that we all have a theology, whether we know it or not. Um, we have a theology and our knowledge of God, the way we think about God affects everything in our life. And, um, you know, the way we think about God, the way we understand who he is, should uh, it should change our prayers, it should change how we spend our time. Um, it should change how we spend our money. It should change how we love, how we serve, how we worship. And I think the most difficult of this is the how is going to be very personal to each of you because you all are in different stages of your walk with Christ. You are all in different stages of life. And so the how of how this study is going to be shaping you is going to be very personal. And um, I really hope that you continue to reflect on this and you feel comfortable sharing with me, um, you know, either in private or in email or in, in a group setting, how this has continued to, to shape you. Um, so yeah, I would love to know if you come to any concrete um, answers of that. I would love to hear how this is um, affecting you and changing your life. But anyways, um, but yeah, so uh, our theology shapes the God um, 
we present to the world as well. Um, and we don't want to leave anything else besides the glorious God of the Bible to our future generations. Um, so I think the Western church is starting to look a lot like um, a, a rescue mission. We are, we're here to catch a last few snatch a, the last few stragglers from the fire um, before Jesus returns. And, um, and I know it can feel like that um, as we see our culture become increasingly secular. Um, but I think that view of the church, um, the bride of Christ is not worthy of who God is. So, you know, we don't know when God is coming back. Um, last week, uh, the ladies who were in my discussion group, we had some, they, ha someone had some amazing insight into the benefits of not going, not knowing God's full plan. And I can't remember who proposed the idea, but someone, we all kind of agreed that if we knew how long something was going to take, we might not even bother to start. And so, you know, I, we need to have this urgency that, you know, if that Christ might be coming tomorrow, but um, we also need to have the wisdom to leave a legacy of solid truth if Christ returns in 200 years. So, um, so yeah, so let's continue to press on and know God more. Um, so self-existence, the God of infinite creativity and self-sufficient, the God of infinite provision, so hopefully you guys read chapters three and four. <laughs> I think that's the one it was. Um, so the reason I wanted to do our chapters a little out of order is because when if we're going to be uh, doing, you know, in these middle weeks, two character attributes a week, I really wanted to do these ones together because I think these two traits go hand in hand. Um, um, and here's why. Um, God is self-sufficient. <laughs> <laughs> because he is self-existent. I think I would like to unpack that more, but I really truly believe that he is self-sufficient because he is self-existent. Um, we've already established that God is eternal, so he has always existed. Um, but rarely we do we think about what God was doing before creation. And I think that's where we kind of get into why it's so important that he is self-existent. So, it may not seem relevant to us in our mission here on earth, but I believe this question is probably one of the most important questions our theology answers. Um, and this kind of is a question that really meant a lot to me, you know, as I was a young Christian, um, I was tasked with reading this book for a seminary class that I was taking was not officially enrolled in seminary. It was part of another program, but, um, but yeah, so we were charged with reading this book called Delighting in the Trinity. Um, it's an, it's the subtitle is an introduction to the Christian faith and the theology of the Trinity really has kind of helped me understand God and understand his attributes on a whole nother level. So I feel like we have to spend some time discussing the theology of the Trinity, um, in order to fully get a full picture of who God is. So, um, because God is self-existent and he is self-sufficient, I think that's where the Holy Trinity and the theology behind that comes in. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God and three distinct persons. That is what we would call the Trinity. Um, so I'm going to read a section from um, Delighting in the Trinity here because... Okay. Before creation, before all things we saw, the Father was loving and begetting his Son. For eternity, that was, that was what the Father was doing. He did not become Father at some point. Rather, his very identity is to be the one who begets the Son. That is who he is. Thus, it is not as if the Father and the Son bumped into each other at some point and found their surprise found to their surprise how remarkably well they got on. The Father is who He is by virtue of His relationship with the Son. Think again of the image of the fountain. A fountain is not a fountain if it does not pour forth water. Just so, the Father would not be the Father without His Son, whom He loves through the Spirit. And the Son would not be the Son without His Father, 
He has his very being from the Father. And so we see that the Father, Son, and Spirit, while distinct persons, are absolutely inseparable from each other. Not confused or undividable, they are who they are together. They are all, they always are together, and thus they always work together. So this theology, this idea that God, three parts in one, has always existed together um, is is. I've heard it described as the oxygen of the Christian faith. It is the linchpin that makes our God different from all other gods, and it is what makes our God self-sufficient. Um, if you'll turn with me in None Like Him to page 59, I think Jen describes this so aptly and why it is um, so important that um, our God is self-sufficient, or sorry, <laughs> self-existent. Um, She says, halfway down the page, she says, this is news to some of us who are taught to believe that God created humans out of a need for love or companionship. It sounds so good, doesn't it? The idea that his crowning act of creation was intended to fill a human-shaped hole in his transcendent heart. But there are no voids in his being, no gaps he must fill to be made whole. He is whole already, wholly loving and wholly loved within the perfect eternal companionship of the Trinity. The Father has always loved the Son, who has always loved the Spirit, who has always loved the Father. No need for love or companionship prompted the Godhead to speak us into being. He created us gladly and he loves us infinitely, but he does not need us. Then jumping down to the next page. Um, we need him every hour, but he needs us not at all. Certainly not for life, but also not for love or worship. Not to bring him glory, not to bring reason to his existence. He is wholly provided for and wholly providing and would be so had and would be so had we never been formed of the dust. This is exactly this is actually the best news we could hear because if God needed us in any way, we mo we would most certainly let him down. So praise God that his plans do not rely on my faithfulness. His joy doesn't hinge on my good be behavior. His glory doesn't be depend on my performance. So uh, why create us at all? <laughs> why create us when God was fully satisfied in himself before time? Um, I want to read a section from Delighting in the Trinity because this book actually describes all this way better than I can articulate. So um, let me read this section about um, why God created us and, you know, why it matters. Uh, Sibs, a rough contemporary of Shakespeare, was a Puritan preacher and theologian who spoke so winningly of the kindness and love of God that he came to be known as the honey-mouthed preacher. Yet it was not simply that Sibs was born with a sunny disposition. He himself was adamant that it is our view of God that shapes us most deeply. We become like what we worship. And Sibs clearly saw the triune God as winning, kind, and lovely. He spoke of the living God as a life-giving, warming sun who delights to spread his beams and his influence in inferior things to make all things fruitful. Such a goodness is in God as is in a fountain or in the breast that loves to ease itself of milk. That is, God is simply bursting with warm and life imparting nourishment, far more willing to give than we are to receive. And that he explained is precisely why he created the world. If God had not a communicative spreading goodness, he would never have created the world. The Father, Son, and Holy Ghost were happy in themselves and enjoyed one another before the world was. Apart from the fact that God delights to communicate and spread his goodness, there had never been a creation or redemption. It is not then that God needed to create the world in order to satisfy himself or to be himself. Um, the divine majesty of this God is not dependent on the world. The Father, Son, and Spirit were happy in themselves and enjoyed one another before the world was. But the Father so enjoyed his fellowship with his Son that he wanted to have the goodness of it spread out and communicated or shared with others. 
The creation was a free choice born out of nothing but love. It was the knowledge that God is so sunny, so radiant with goodness and love that made Sibs such an attractive model of godlikeness. For he said, those that are led with the spirit of God that are like him, they have a communicative, diffusive goodness that loves to spread itself. In other words, knowing God's love, he became loving and his understanding of who God is transformed him into a man, a preacher and a writer of magnetic geniality. That amiability shown through his preaching. It still glows from his writing and looking at his life, it is clear that he had quite uh, an extraordinary ability for cultivating warm and lasting friendships. He had become like his God. So I love that section of this book. This is a great book um, about the Trinity and all that it means for the Christian walk. And I highly recommend it um, for if you'd like to dive even more into that. But um, but yeah, so I really hope that can become true of all of us, that in knowing God, we are transformed um, by his love and the love that we we receive from him. And then that we, in turn, communicate that love and communicate who he is, the, all the glory and all the majesty of who he is to others. Um, this is our task. And, you know, as I said at the beginning of today's lesson, we don't know when Jesus is coming back. Um, this is not just a rescue mission. We, in while it is eminent and we feel that eminentness of Jesus's return with every fiber of our being, because we are not eternal, but we have eternal, e eternality, or we have eternity in our hearts. Um, that's how the verse goes. We have eternity in our hearts. So we our time bound bodies. We are so aware that Jesus return is eminent, but eminent is, is a mystery to us in the way that God sees eminent. Um, and you know, the church since 70 AD has thought Jesus is coming back right now. And so, um, you know, it may feel like we are just, you know, just snatching of the last few people, but while we're here, while we are doing work as if, you know, Jesus is coming back tomorrow, we have to be building a legacy. We have to be building a legacy of truth that we can give on to our generations, which is why it is so important that we know our God. We know who He is so we can give an accurate account of Him to the world. Mm -hmm.